Hi everyone, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are, or good evening. I'm Rabbi Julia Andelman, Director of Community Engagement at JTF, and I'm so happy to welcome you to today's session of our summer learning series on stories and storytelling. Uh, special welcome to anyone who's joining us for the first time today. And um, speaking of people joining us for the first time, we're so pleased to have a new scholar joining us today, um, Dr. Miriam Feldman Kay is um, an adjunct associate professor at JTS. And when we, when we have adjuncts, um, meaning you know, someone who is coming in to teach um, one or a few courses, we, uh, we try to pounce on them um, to just take, take advantage of the opportunity to, um, to hear the voices of new scholars we don't normally get to encounter. So we're so pleased um, that Dr. Miriam Feldman, Feldman K is teaching us today. And, her session is called Passion and Violence, a Contemporary Philosophical Reading of the Sacrifice of Isaac. Um, so we will um, get some new, uh, this kind of a new, a new perspective for us for this series to kind of a philosophical take and we're so um, excited to see uh, what she teaches. Um, we don't have any sponsors today. We would love to invite um, all you folks to continue uh, sponsoring, which makes really a transformative difference in our being able to offer this series. We have three sponsorship levels, which um, are going into the chat now. Um, and feel free to contact us for more information. Um, and I will now turn it over to Tanya Schwartz Herman for some additional announcements. Thank you, Rabbi Andelman. Um, so, just to review uh, the format of today's session. Um, uh, Dr. Feldman Kay will pause for questions periodically throughout the class. Um, we'll also have some time for Q&A at the end of our session. Um, you can use the chat feature to submit your questions to Rabbi Julia Andelman. Um, and uh, during the Q&A period, we'll uh, select a few of the questions to present to uh, Dr. Feldman Kay. Uh, for any technical or logistical questions, please initiate a private chat with either myself or with Ellie Gettinger, uh, the JTS staff that are on the, the Zoom. Uh, the sources for today's class were uh, the PowerPoint presentation actually was um, in the email that you received with the Zoom link uh, this morning, and um, we'll be screen sharing them as well. Um, so pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Miriam Feldman Kay, an adjunct associate professor at JTS and lecturer in Jewish philosophy at Bar Ilan University. Uh, Dr. Feldman Kay's research focuses on modern and contemporary Jewish philosophy and the study of religion, specifically existentialism, deconstructionism, and hermeneutics. Um, she is a re recipient of the University of Cambridge Theological Studies Prize and holds a BA from Cambridge University, Faculty of Divinity. She received her MA from the University of London and her PhD in Jewish thought from the University of Haifa. Um, and we're so pleased to have her uh, teaching us for the first time um, in the series today. I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to Dr. Feldman Kay. Hi there, everybody. I know for most of you, it's uh, uh, middle of the day. For me, it's good evening. Um, so good day to you. Um, Thank you very much to Rabbi Handelman and the JTS team for inviting me um, to join you in this special webinar series. Um, so what I want to do really is to take a story that many of us um, know. And when I say many of us, uh, we can talk really very broadly. We can talk um, Jewish community, we can talk monotheistic community, we could even dare to say um, in, a, in a monotheistic universal capacity, we could talk about this story as a foundational story um, in one of the most fundamental uh, biblical texts. And this is the story of the binding of Isaac or what we will refer to it as um, this, today, the Akeda. Okay, literally the, the binding. The story um, is also known as um, the sacrifice of Isaac. And we're going to um, look at, look at the, um, the differences between those. And what I'd like to do really is to invite you on a journey with me. 
And that journey involves us placing to the side much of the textual information that we have about the story of the Akedah. We're going to put to side even some of the Midrashic information or learning that we know about the Akedah and all other interpretations that we know about the Akedah, because today we're going to look at the Pshat, at the text itself, and we're going to dedicate this period of time to looking at philosophical interpretations. And this mainly we're going to be looking at Jewish philosophical interpretations. How has this story been understood and re-understood and revised and revisited in Jewish communities of yore. We're going to look at this, particularly in the modern period. And then I'd like to end by really suggesting that this, that our philosophical reading poses very important questions for us today about what it is to be Jewish, what it means to be part of a community, what it means as an individual to have a conscience, a moral or an ethical conscience? How do we run our lives um, in, in terms of that conscience? And in light of our religious commitment, our religious belief or disbelief or, or, or struggles or challenges that we have, how are we meant to navigate our way in our, in our Jewishness um, on that path with the use of this philosophical uh, look at this story. How do all of these things come together? And how are we going to weave in a philosophical um, picture, a philosophical interpretation of the Akeda? Okay, so I think the first thing really is to um, to know that you're that you're with me, and we initially were kind of kind of commit to putting our textual knowledge of the Akeda to the side. OK, and we're we're also I think it's also it's quite challenging um, given the, the its its meaning and significance on many uh, textual levels, but also in terms of um, of history. You know, I'm coming and I'm saying to you, we're going to be looking at modern philosophy. Well, what does that mean about pre-modern philosophy? When I say modern, I'm talking here about the um, 18th century um, and until present day. Um, and, and so that's also, I think, a, a challenge to talk about really kind of maybe our era or the philosophy that's closer to us and to put away maybe um, what we thought to the side. But nevertheless, this is a, um, an exploration that we're going to undertake together. And I hope it's meaningful to you. And I hope that we will um, manage to raise some um, new, new, old, old, new, um, and very important questions for us all um, through this study. Okay, so we're going to um, dive straight in um, to the text, again, looking at the, at the pshat. And once we've done that, I'm going to um, straight away open up with um, uh, an explanation of what it means when I say philosophy, what is the main philosophy around this story? What are the problems with that? What are the challenges? How can it help us to think um, 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 and live even in different ways Jewishly? And with that, we're going to look at a, um, a line of, of, of different sources over the course of the, um, mainly we're going to look at the 20th century. So it's a very contemporary look, ultimately, at the Akeda, and I hope you enjoy it and find it meaningful. So the first source that we are going to look at is the is the Pshat of the of the Akeda. Okay. Um, The Pshat of the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, is from Genesis uh, 22, verses 1 to 18. And it's worth noting that it's a very short story. Um, and so much storytelling can go um, 
can happen around such a, a, a short story is, is a fascinating question um, in and of itself. Needless to say, the, the, the commentaries are, um, are, are broad and they're rich. Um, and just before we, we, we open up the chat, I mean, you'll notice, you will have noticed already that I've put a couple of images here up on the screen. And I think one of the things that we can immediately notice is how jarring these images can be. They're not always, but we're really picturing a scene of or, or viewing a scene of, um, of violence in front of our eyes. And I think this also reflects our, our textual impression of the story when we're, it's really about the murder of one's child. And often the Akedaz is construed as a story of uh, commitment to God or commitment to, to, to one, a Jewish commitment. Um, God tested Abraham, that kind of strain of thought. But essentially here, there's something very violent um that we can't ignore and that's also um a part of how we jewishly um perhaps you know we read interpretations in the past but what's important for us also is how are we going to interpret this story what do we do with violent scenes what do we do with impressions uh, of um of, of of difficulty and harshness um in, in the world around us as Jewish people. Okay, so when you see these images and when you see these texts, there's a visual level, but there's also a challenge that it poses to us. Um, Dr. Feldman Kay, can I just interrupt you for one moment? Just ask you to um, define um, define the term shot just for, for those people who aren't already familiar with that term. Sure. So I'm sorry for assuming a familiarity. So pshat is a Hebrew word. Um, in, in modern Hebrew, pashut means uh, simple. When we talk about it in text, we're normally talking about um, the pshat is the, the plain meaning of the text. Um, and it's a word that's it, it's not a philosophical term um, at all. It's, it's used in uh, Midrashic Talmudic writing um, and commentaries on the biblical text. So how is pshat different from any other kind of reading? Um, because it means that we're going to try and look purely at the text before us, the text that we see, um, without the commentary around it. Does that clarify? That's perfect, thank you. Okay. So we're just going to um, read through this. Um, I'm going to read the, the, the Hebrew and the, and the English for you and um, just follow it through. Take time to look at it, even if it's a text that, you know, um, just take the time to kind of to, uh, to see what you notice and pay, pay particular attention to the to the individuals, to the people. OK, are you ready? ויהי אחר הדברים האלה, ואלוהים נישא את אברהם. ויאמר אליו אברהם, ויאמר הנני. Sometime afterward, God put Abraham to the test. God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham. And Abraham answered, here I am. Okay, so we already have a question here of what is the human response or well, the ideal human response to God is to say, here I am, as being in a state of uh, readiness. Vayomel, kach na et bincha et yechidcha, asher ahavta et yitzchak, velech lecha el eretz hamoria, vehe'elehu sham le'ola, al achat ha'harim, asher omar elecha. Take your son, your favored one, Isaac, who you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the heights that I will point out to you. In other words, take your child, and it's stressed here, the one that you love, 
the one who is special to you, Ayachid, and sacrifice him to God. Vayashkem Avraham Baboker, Vayachavosh et Chamoro, Vayikach et Shnei Nearav Ito, Vayet Yitzchak Beno, Vayivaka at Se Ola, Vayakom, Vayelech El Hamakom Asher Amarlo Elohim. So early the next morning, Abraham saddled his ass and took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. He split the wood for the burnt offering and he set out for the place of which God had told him. Okay, so here we have uh, a sense of uh, alacrity or readiness as well. We know that when the Bible tells us, if somebody woke up early, I know it's not true for all of us, but normally the sense is that, you know, that there is a, a willingness or a, or a readiness to kind of get on with the job as soon as possible. That's the... Um, um, that's the implication. Bayom hashlishi, vayisa Avraham et enav. I actually can't see the top of it. Hang on. So I'm sharing my screen. One second. Vayisa Avraham et enav, vayar et hamakom merachok. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place from afar. Okay, it was a long journey. ויאמר אברהם אל נערב, שבו לכם פה עם החמור, ואני והנער נלכה עד כה ונשתחווה ונשובה עליכם. אברהם said to his servants, you stay here with the donkey, the boy and I will go up there, we will worship and we will return to you. Um, this is a very interesting verse on, on, on several counts. Firstly, we're aware that there were other people there, okay, which when we're going to be talking about people and ethical um, uh, relations, we're going to refer back to this. There are other people there. And what does he tell them? He doesn't tell them exactly the truth of his intention. He tells him that we will worship and we will return to you. Okay, so it's here, it's unclear um what abraham really thought was going to happen vayikach vayikach avraham et atse ha'ola vayasem al yitzhak bno vayikach biyado et ha'esh ve'et ha'ma'achelet vayelchu shnehem yachtav abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and put it on his son isaac he himself took the firestone and the knife and the two walked off together. Vayomer Yitzchak el Avraham Aviv. Vayomer Avi. Vayomer Hineni Bni. Vayomer Hine Haesh Vahaetzim. Vaye Hase. Laola. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, father. And he answered, Yes, my son. And he said, Here is the firestone and the wood, but where is the sheep? for the burnt offering. In other words, who have we come here to sacrifice? Okay, and normally this is kind of the point of, uh, of, of uh, innocence and, and, and revealing um, because he, Isaac, uh, does not know what is, um, what is about to happen. Let's see what Abraham says to his son. Vayomer Avraham Elohim Yira'elo. And Abraham said, it is God who will see to the sheep for this burnt offering, my son. And the two of them walked on together. So that was a kind of pause in their journey um, where he says to his son, don't worry, God has a plan. Let's carry on walking. And let's see what happens now. ויבואו אל המקום אשר אמר לו האלוהים, ויבן שם אברהם את המזבח, ויערוך את העצים, ויעקוד את יצחק בנו, ויישם אותו על המזבח ממעל לעצים. They arrived at the place of which God had told him. Abraham built an altar there, he laid out the wood, he bound his son Isaac, and he laid, them, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. 
And now it's quite clear what's about to happen. But is it just Isaac? Is it Abraham here who are wondering, you know, at, at what point this is going to stop? And note here also, when we're going to talk about the philosophical perspective about individuals, that the pshat, the plain meaning here of the text is not giving us any emotional response, right? This is a, 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 an account um, of, of, of a parable, of a, of a story, okay? Other than Isaac's question. Um, until now, there is no emotion revealed at this stage. And Abraham picked up the knife to slay his son. Then a messenger of God called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, and he answered, Here I am. Don't raise your hand upon that child. Don't even harm him one little bit. There's no need to hurt him anymore because now you know. Now I know that you are a God-fearing individual um, because you were even willing to sacrifice your son. That's the crux of the story, but I think the, the, the end of it is also um, um, interesting for us, but I will read it a little bit um, quicker. Again, just notice that any um, uh, interhuman, any human relations here. Abraham noticed a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. Abraham went, took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in place of his son. Okay, um, so there's a, um, a backup plan, perhaps, if you like. Vaikra Avraham Shem Hamakom Hahu. Hashem yira'e, asher yamar hayom bahar Hashem yira'e. Abraham named that site Adonai yira'e, um, and it means really till this, the, the language is quite complex here, it means that, you know, until this day, um, it's a site of revelation, ultimately. Um, Vaikra malach Hashem. El Avraham Shenit Min Hashamayim. And the messenger of God called to Abraham a second time from the heaven. Vayomer bi nishpati neum Hashem, ki ya'an asher asita et hadavar haze. Velo chashachta et bincha et yechidcha. Okay, because you have done this, because you are willing to give up your your um your your child and this is the great promise and from the next two verses that we're about to read we realize the significance of this story i will bestow my blessing upon you and make your descendants as numerous as all the stars in the heaven and your descendant and the sand as many your descendants will be as many as the grains of sand on the seashore and your descendants shall seize the gates of their foes all of the nations of the earth, listen to this, shall bless themselves by your descendants because you have obeyed my command. In a few sentences, that, that is the story. That, that is the story that we are talking about. 
and the frame of it, and especially that where there is the 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 crux, I suppose the and um, the the tension in the middle when he raises the knife, and then God says to him, "Do not touch your son, don't even harm him." And then the crux of the story, what what gives it its um, huge significance, is that the entire kind of flourishing potentially of the um, of the of the Jewish people is linked in later interpretations to Abraham's willingness to go through with this trial. And now, in a sense, we we return to one of the questions we mentioned at the beginning, which is about the violence and about how something can seem so against the grain so wrong but yet if it comes from a divine source what does that mean when we look at those violent images and when we read a violent text and we know or we are taught or, or we believe something that that is the divine will then what do we need to do what goes through our minds and this is in in a sense one of the, the kind of the um, attempts in Jewish commentary to, to, to navigate that path for us. And that's been done in, in, in many of the Jewish con um, uh, commentaries. But as per our journey today, we are going to turn firstly to the thought of a Christian philosopher, theologian of the 19th century, called Søren Kierkegaard. And um, Kierkegaard is known as the, um, the, the, the founder of the movement religious existentialism. And now I'm going to just explain what existentialism is. And we're going to see how that plays out in this story. So the first thing I want to say about Kierkegaard is that most of his philosophy is based around the story of the Akeda. He seems to be aware of some Jewish commentary, even though it's unclear. I would say I doubt that he met anybody Jewish, but he does that in some of his writings, he does seem to show an awareness of um, of Jew, a Jewish commentary, and it's a it's a it's a book, it's a philosophical commentary on the Akeda that I would recommend. We have time just to touch on it um, um, today. Existentialism is a philosophical movement that too began in the nineteenth century, and it was really one of the most popular philosophical movements in the 19th and 20th centuries. And religious existentialism, which is what was put forward by Kierkegaard, stresses the following points. That instead of talking about religion rationally, we should talk from our personal experience. Our religious experience is one of the most important tools, so say religious existentialism, to, to explain what our faith is and what our religion is. Now, I think for many of us, that sounds obvious in today's world and in today's Jewish world, um, Western world at least, we talk about our religious experience, our Jewish experience, our experience in the synagogue, our learning experience. And I know, you know, in, in, in the, um, the JTS context that the student experience is, is, is extremely important. And, um, but at the, crux of the kind of the the, the crux of modernity the, the 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 primary way to talk about religion was through rationalist logic so if you want to talk about god you need to prove the existence of god today if we want to talk about god there are different schools of thought 
Some people would say they sense God. Some people would say God is in the tradition. Some would talk about revelation. There are different approaches to it. One of those approaches is as existentialist because it's based on human experience. And the religious experience means that we're talking about ourselves. The rationalists sought to speak about religion universally. If they will set out to prove the existence of God, they want that to be done for everybody. To talk about experience is personal, is subjective. And this is what Kierkegaard put forward. So what does he have to say from this existentialist position about Abraham? There was one, and here he's talking about, he's talking about Abraham now, who relied upon himself and gained everything. There was one who in the security of his own strength sacrificed everything. That, that that one that he's talking about until now, that is your kind of your, your average human being. And here you can see what I've put in italics is, is when he talks about Abraham. But the one who believed in God was the greatest of all. Okay, so just we'll look back from the beginning. There are people in the world, he says, who rely upon themselves. They gain everything. They go about their daily lives. They don't necessarily need God or religion. In this, their own security, they might sacrifice things, but you know, for 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 day to day um, or material ends. Kierkegaard says the one who believed God was the greatest of all. And here he goes back to his other kind of regular type of person. There was one who was great by virtue of his power and one who was great by virtue of his wisdom and one who was great by virtue of his hope and one who was great by virtue of his love. But Abraham was the greatest of all, great by that power whose strength is powerlessness. What is this text saying? saying well there are many people in the world and people can be great in different ways and for different reasons there are wise people there are powerful people and there are people who have great hope there are people who love deeply and are great people on the individual level but he says that the true greatness and the true strength is being powerless. And why, in Kierkegaard's view, was Abraham so praiseworthy? Because he gave up, he relinquished his own power, and he said, hey, I will do what you say. Hineni, I am here, I will do what you say. And that is the great strength of Abraham for Kierkegaard, that he is powerless. Now, although there might be some religious value in being prepared to give up everything for God, and here as a Christian, there's a very um, innate um, um, description of, of, of Jesus and the sacrificial element there. And in a Jewish perspective, is this sense of powerlessness and relinquishing of everything, is that really what greatness is? Who is the ideal person? What's the ideal way to live? By being wise or loving? By being powerful or by being powerless or by being powerless? And I don't think um, it, it, would be a, um, it would be wrong to say that powerlessness, well, we actually teach people and we want people to take 
power and to take um, uh, responsibility for what is around them and not to do simply what they are told without asking questions. We are meant to be conscious and mindful of the, um, of the decisions we make and the ways that we think. Now, this philosopher Kierkegaard, he remains, I believe, the greatest philosopher who writes about the Akedah. You will be hard pressed to find um, any Jewish philosopher of modern times who does not talk about Kierkegaard when they talk about the Akedah. And this is because he offers quite a convincing picture of why Abraham is great. However, there are also, there have been some big critiques of Kierkegaard. And especially, um, we're going to look at three of those very briefly, okay? Critics um, of Kierkegaard, because they offer other models of Abraham. Models of Abraham that say religion is not about powerlessness. And they seek to frame it differently. And this reframing comes against existentialism. And listen to this, because they say the critics, our personal experience is not the be all and end all of our religious faith. Our religious experience, our subjugation or our powerlessness in front of a, a, a divine being is not the ultimate meaning of Judaism. It's not only about religious experience. And they call for a turn towards dialogue. Okay, which we could also call community. And um, we're going to um, see how that plays out now through through um, through some of these critics, but we can put this thinker Kierkegaard in the background for the moment because he becomes the one who they resist. He becomes the one who the Jew who most of the Jewish philosophers come against. And they say it is not our purpose to become powerlessness. One of the greatest Jewish philosophers of modern times was called Franz Rosenzweig. And Franz Rosenzweig was one of the first philosophers to set out a model of what is called dialogical thought from the word dialogue. The idea of dialogue is discourse, it's communication, it's conversation and it's encounter. And he was a great critic of Kierkegaard, as are the other Jewish philosophers we're going to uh, look at. And he said, this type of religious experience, you know, this is, it, it's like living in a, in a vacuum. No, why? Because while you're being powerlessness and while you are being called to the divine will, Murder is going on. Evil is going on in your society. So you might think you might extol this Abraham um, and you might lord him because of his religiosity and his willingness to listen to God. But look at the community you're living in. Look at the evil in society. Look at the war. Look at the crime. Where's the justice? This is not our type of religion. He says, and we're going to look at how Rosenzweig begins to talk about this, and then we're going to see how this plays out in Levinas. Okay, um, if there are any um, questions of uh, clarification, please write to uh, Rabbi Andelman, 
um, and she can pass those on to me. Okay. So I think after we've read Rosenzweig, we'll, um, we can also take some uh, questions. So this is Rosenzweig, he, um, his, his um, magnum opus is called The Star of Redemption, it was written in 1917. And I've taken really a couple of sentences to express for you here the meaning of dialogue, okay? And he's writing here in terms of um, Abraham, but also for us now, we're moving over to this idea of the individual and dialogue. Here is the I, the individual human I, as yet wholly receptive, as yet only unlocked, only empty, without content, come out without nature pure readiness, pure obedience. The commandment, and he, when he's talking about the commandment, he's talking about the, um, the commandment of God to Abraham, is the first content to drop into this attentive hearing. In other words, this isn't just about hearing or being attentive or being powerlessness. You also have to listen to the message that is being told to you. And if you're being told to sacrifice your son or to do something evil, you need to hear the content of that and not just the fact that you are having a divine call. I'm continuing here where my cursor is. The summons to hear, the address by the given name, the seal of the discoursing divine mouth, all these are but preface to every commandment. This is amazing. What's Rosenzweig saying here? He's saying that the utterance of every commandment, in this case, the Akeda, once the divine utterance has been made, or once that commandment has been written down or commanded, that's only the beginning of the story. That's just the preface, that's the introduction. Because the real commandment or the real religious life is about a dialogue of human and divine interaction around that commandment. And so here we can see this, um, what he's saying about how Kierkegaard is presenting Abraham is, well, he thinks he's receptive, he thinks he's unlocked, but actually he's just listening to an empty voice. How do we know this is an empty voice? Because he's prepared to kill his child. And so our human um, um, involvement and judgment of the divine calls are critical. They are so important. And in this first Jewish philosophical um, um, response to Kierkegaard, we're beginning to understand the problem with maybe how this has traditionally been understood and what new approaches Jewish philosophy can offer. Okay, so we'll take a brief pause and then we're going to kind of reach the, the climax of the, uh, move towards the climax of the Jewish philosophical response. All right, lots of wonderful questions. Um, <laughs> so just focusing on the, on the powerlessness. Um, so one person points out what, I was gonna say the obvious, but maybe it's not because we're so focused on Abraham. But the one who's really powerless in the story is Isaac. And this person asks, what, you know, what kind of what kind of God asks this and what kind of person does this? And it's not even God asking Abraham to sacrifice himself, right? It's to act, it's it's um someone else who didn't who didn't agree to this. Well, that's a that's a brilliant question. Um um, so far, we haven't spoken about um, all of the, the other individuals here. Um, there's a lot of silence 
um, as well that goes on, the silence of Isaac, the silence of Sarah, okay, and, you know, also a feminist interpretation here would be very important. Um, and then we also know that there are these servants um, who are also in the picture. Um, I think the best way to respond is really to, um, to, to move to the next philosophical um, viewpoint who talks more about um, another voice that comes into the story. Um, suffice it to say that what we know about Isaac is that, yeah, Isaac is, is powerless, Isaac is silent, and some commentators say that he remains silent, I think, for the rest of his life as portrayed in the text. Um, and, you know, perhaps traumatized in a way from this, uh, from, from what has happened. And, you know, from a, a brief look at the paintings, you know, let put aside the text can, can, can make us really be aware of the, of the horror that's involved here. And I think it's, it's very right to talk about his impression, as well as this kind of supposedly important dialogue going on between um, um, God and humanity. And I'd go further than that and say that actually the silence there, the textual silence around Abraham and um, around Isaac and around Sarah, who I'm including here, um, actually exemplifies the whole problem because if nobody else if everybody else is being silenced and everybody else in the story is being othered or even lied to um then that should even further you know call our attention to the fact that this supposedly divine call is deeply problematic So, and this was a question from before the, before we started looking at the philosophers, if, if you want to take that, um, just kind of taking you up on your challenge to, to read the shot. Um, one person, you know, raised the fact that um, there are, there are views that perhaps the original story or a reading of the story has has Abraham going through um, with the sacrifice, right? If you pull apart the, the different biblical sources, the E source and the J source, which might be new to some people, but right, if, you, if, you, if you excise the J and the section with J references in the middle, um, you yeah. have a source where they, you know, Abraham goes up to the mountain with the servants and, and with Isaac and comes back down just with the servants. Um, and this whole encounter with God and sort of stopping him. And now I know you're faithful. Um, there are readings that excise that. And, and so, you know, someone was saying, if we're really, if you really want to look up shot, um, is, is it that? And, and I don't know what you want to sort of what you want to make of that um, kind of on a, on a shot level. And do we ignore that? Cause not, that's not where the text ended up or. Yeah. Um... Well, wow. well, that's a um, it's a great question. The um, in reading the chat, the names of God are you might have noticed are um, are different and they're critical and and definitely in a, a Bible scholarly session um, we could definitely kind of uh, remap, take apart, and look at the um, the different text and yes it has been suggested that it, it could be could have been uh, construed differently um also in other jewish and 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 other texts altogether there have been kind of different replays in a way textual replays of uh of what happened um but for our for our purpose when we do go along when we <laughs> um, accept the invitation to go along the philosophical line, and this is really, you know, for the for the sake of time and also focus, um, um, we are going to look at the text as as is today. Um, even though I do think it's very important to look at those um, other aspects of the biblical text. That's that's quite fair. Um, so maybe yeah. just one one more question related to the powerlessness, because a number of people asked it. Um, 
why is it that that Abraham seems to see himself as powerless here, whereas, you know, in the adjacent story with Sodom, he he feels very um, confident in in pushing back against God's yeah. brilliant, destructive um, tendency. Um, so it's a great question because it raises the, the, the this idea of the different uh, facets of Abraham, the different models of Abraham, uh, as I call it. And it's also a great question because it brings us uh, <laughs> uh, back into our into our study, which is, you know, this isn't the only Abraham. And we have the Abraham of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we're going to um, look at him in uh, in just one minute. So and, and that's also, you know, it's another huge thing to talk about um, a model of, a, of an individual because here we're also talking about a model of a, of a particular scenario of a particular scene um, in a story which is limiting right we're talking about a particular individual in a particular scene so we're ruling out Isaac Sarah <laughs> we're ruling out other types of okay but but we're also um, we, we do want to kind of to uh, to focus on this idea of, um, of the ideal, the religious individual, kind of keep track of all of those things at the side, um, as well as realizing that we can't go into them, but we are going to hint at this, uh, um, at this other type of, um, of Abraham, okay? So we are going to arrive at that now. One of the strongest Jewish philosophical rejections of, um, of Kierkegaard's Abraham is that of Emmanuel Levinas, the French Jewish philosopher. And like Rosenzweig, he was against existentialism. He believed that if you just focus on the religious experience, then you're not really dealing with society, with injustice. You're just talking about yourself and to yourself and what's meaningful to you. But actually we have a whole society to look after. We have a greater, um, um, uh, responsibility, which is one of his key words, to society at large, to our community, wherein, you know, religious uh, or, or, you know, the individual experience and even revelation, he says, can happen in our relation to the other. Okay, so it's only in, in the way that we relate to other people that there is religious significance at all a kind of so-called ideal humanity God um, dynamic. It's not really how this is supposed to be, says Levinas. And he is very, very um, um, critical of, um, of Kierkegaard. Now, one of the things just to, um, to spin back to, to Rosenzweig, because also Levinas does it, is that he points to this Abraham in Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, well, hang on, this isn't a passive Abraham here. We could point to the Abraham in Sodom and Gomorrah, the one who fights, who negotiates um, with God, who resists God's command for absolute disaster and destruction, and even challenges um, um, God to behave in a more just way and the moral development of, of one's character in that way is, 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 is personified by Abraham in that sense and a second example is that of Abraham in light of the exiles and we're going to look at that in a few minutes as, as well um, because Abraham's story, 
in terms of kind of, you know, mapping out a broader picture of Abraham, it doesn't begin with him being offered to, to sacrifice his son. It begins with him being commanded to leave, to leave his land of birth um, and go to the unknown. And this uh, Rosenzweig based, is, calls it as, you know, the first exile in its earliest beginnings, which then resonates, mirrors, echoes towards further exiles, biblical exiles, historical exiles, um, and, um, and even to contemporary notions of exile. But within those different models, Rosenzweig says that there is the model of the Hineni. Hineni, I am present, I am willing, I am open, I'm spontaneous, I'm impulsive. And those are some of the different character traits that he stresses in Abraham and not a powerlessness and not a passivity. Now listen to this for the, for the person or the people who asked about um, um, the, the silence or the, the silenced in the story. Um, let's actually ask and um, talk about the, the moments of silence. In other words, you know, we do have some speech in this story, um, but there are also things that we, things that we don't hear about. Um, and for Levinas, the greatest moment, the best part of the story, if you like, is the moment where the angel says, stop, don't raise your hand to your child. That for him is the, is the crux of the story. Now, when I taught this to some of my students, I, one student said, well, you know, isn't there also here the voice of the angel? Because there is an angel there who, who has um, a voice, who instructs Abraham to stop. Um, which is also, you know, is there kind of a, a, a silencing there of a different voice? Levinas says that that voice is Abraham's conscience. And that's the part of the story that we're meant to be looking at. Perhaps Abraham's ear, as it says, for hearing the voice that brought him back to the ethical order was the highest moment in this drama. Kierkegaard never speaks of the situation in which Abraham enters into dialogue with God. Oh, sorry to intercede in favor of Sodom and Gomorrah in the name of the just who might be present there. So Levinas is saying that, you know, precisely as, Ro as Rosenzweig said, if you're going to focus on the Abraham of the, of the Akedah, you're not going to hear about the Abraham who negotiated with God and said, Can you, are you not, you know, you're not behaving justly towards these uh, supposedly evil people who are present here in, these, in this city. Um, for Levinas, he also takes issue, and I think I would say we can also take issue with the aspect of violence in this religious story. And, you know, we, we're living in an age of religious fundamentalism as the sociologists explain um, at the least and religious violence is a very relevant um, um, subject today here as 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 Levinas sees it there is a um, uh, an intertwining between being an obedient or an ideal religious person and being willing to use violence and this is a huge ethical problem, um, says Levinas. And Levinas says that it's shocking that this would even be canonized as a religious story. He says it's egotistical um, and subjective to the point of, of, of an amoral 
world. And he also asked the question, well, what would happen if every religious person saw themselves as you know, having some kind of important spiritual connection and was prepared to make, to, to, to enact um, uh, uh, an immoral injustice to one's family or to one's community. This is not how it's meant to be. And another to, to build on this is actually something that is obvious to us in the story, but often we don't realize, and that is this, that the sacrifice itself does not happen. Nobody is killed in the end. And um, as Levinas writes, the ethical order, brought, bringing him back to the ethical order, as in how we would see maybe normal or healthy um, familial relations, um, um, this is how the ethical order should be. So we're not only talking about, well, how should religion look? What is the best way to be religious? We're also talking about society and people and who we are and how we live. The sacrifice itself does not happen. And Levinas said that is the religious message. And I think it's a message that, that we can take away as well. So which Abraham are we meant to see here? Are we meant to see that Abraham we saw above of the, uh, um, um, of the powerlessness? No, we're meant to see the Abraham who listened to his conscience. We must um, um, aspire towards a, um, a Jewish religious vision where we lis listen to our moral conscience where we can hear when something is valuing, you know, is, is perhaps preferring one um, value over another in a way that could seem a little bit skewed. And in this way, Levinas says, the text becomes perhaps um, more bearable. I won't say positive. It becomes bearable because it does not result in murder. And so we don't necessarily have a violent message. Religion does not necessarily equate with violence or murder, but it equates with listening to our conscience. And in that state of moral dilemma on a day-to-day -day life of seeking to do the right thing, and that as being a basis for looking at this story from his philosophical viewpoint. There's a lot of other things we can say, but what I want to share with you, and this is just based on the, um, on, on, on some of the questions, is to um, move to a, a, a final figure who is not as famous as, uh, as, as, um, as Rosenzweig and Kierkegaard. Um, but he talks about, in a sense, some of the um, aspects of religion that have got lost. Okay, we're going to come to that in a minute. So Jacques Derrida, okay, our final uh, philosopher, um, was a, a French philosopher of Jewish origin. He lived between 1930 to 2004, um, born in Algeria and moved um, um, to, to France, and he was the um, founder of an, uh, another movement in, uh, in, in continental um, philosophy. And Derrida is very excited and enthralled by this figure of Abraham, because he's ready to venture outside of his regular sphere and here, you know, we can kind of begin to, to, to listen already to a new um, religious philosophical message of this story of somebody who's ready to venture outside their regular sphere, or as we might say, their comfort zone for a greater purpose, to do what we should do, 
Are we being called to do what we should do or what we ought to do? How does that resonate with us? And how do we respond? And that place of dilemma, and that place of, um, of conscience is where these Jewish philosophers say that Jewish thought should rest. This is where it should be on this, what I ought to do, this place of dilemma and, and, and conscious and somebody who's ready to venture outside of what perhaps might be that expected from the, um, from the normal or the regular um, or even the accepted and to say, you know, what should I do? What should I be standing up for in this particular instance? And in this way, what um, we'll, we'll, we'll read what, um, what Derrida says, and then we will, um, we will close up, okay? So first, firstly, one of the things that Derrida likes about this Abraham is that he says yes. Um, now, I think as soon as we hear that, we think, well, it's, you know, that's it's not always good to give uh, uh, consent, especially when we're not sure what's going to be asked of us. OK, and we know that Abraham does say yes. He says, Hineni, I am present, I'm willing, before he knows what is going to be asked of him. And that also has permutations, you know, in today's world. Without even naming Abraham, prior to daring to issue a summons towards the immense figure of the patriarch presumed to respond to the calling of his name. Yes, here I am, I am here, this is the Hineni. One must know, and he cites here that this is the main thing we should learn from Abraham, that if everything begins for us with the response, if everything begins with the yes implied in all responses, yes, here I am, even if the response is going to be no, then any response, even the most modest, the most mundane of responses, remains an acquiescence given to some self-presentation. The end of that sentence is a little bit obscure, but what we can pick out here is Derrida's emphasis on the idea of response of the idea of um of of being present being present to the core being ready to um to to venture out and um and go beyond one's perhaps regular um realm of 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 behavior and thought to to seek out um, um justice and John Caputo, who is a, a scholar who writes about Derrida, claims that Derrida himself is kind of putting himself in the place of Abraham. And this might be something that we, each of us, choose to do, kind of enacting the story in a personal way. The desert, which is present in the biblical imagery, um, says, Caputo, he says that Derrida really himself is kind of heading out into the desert and he's deserted. Okay, and this is all a play on words, a play on words of desert and, and, and deserted. And when somebody's heading out into the desert by themselves, they're alone, they're perhaps, you know, preoccupied with themselves, they're exiled. Um, linking back to, um, to our, our previous subject. And Levinas here is the, is the compass, okay? Our compass for what ought we to do in a situation where we are called, where we are called to Sodom, where we are called to murder, where we are called to um, head out into the desert or to, or to leave, essentially. Um, and, and in this way, we kind of, bring the story to, a, to an even more acute um, critique of, of, of Kierkegaard because the Abraham we have now painted, the picture we have now painted of Abraham is one of great power. But what is that power? 
that power is one who is mindful, who has a conscience, who has engaged with their community, who's engaged with justice and their surroundings, and who is open to the divine call as well, but not to pay a price for justice in our world. Religion must, as, as Levinas said, we want our religion to be a righteous religion, a wise religion, and a good religion. So let's move to some, um, to some things we can learn from this, and then we're going to end with some questions, okay? So these are some points really that, that we can learn from this study, okay? So firstly, that the idealized Abrahamic character is not actually the person at the center, okay? Often, perhaps when we read a story, we're used to there being a protagonist, there's somebody at the center. It's about them, maybe when we read every story. And two, with this story of the Akedah, there is the main character or characters and the surrounding imagery and, 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 and other silent characters here. And here we are actually being called not to look at only the individual in the center, but also as that same person, that ideal Abraham is the one who is called to leave the center to move away from being that kind of religious hero who murders, but to leave the center, to decenter ourselves, one could even say. The model of Abraham is the one who leaves here, and this is the one who leaves his home, not vacates. Um, and he leaves his one, but this is the one who is commanded um, to know themselves, the one, the Abraham who is sent out um, into, a, into a no man's land. We're meant to note here from this, these Jewish philosophical readings of the story, a move to dialogue, to dialogue with God, to dialogue with the other, um, with the world around us, with society. Although having said that, we are hard pushed to find some kind of dialogue with the characters themselves. And here, the point on the dialogical turn, the dialogical turn is the dialogical thought of these, of these thinkers of Rosenzweig and Levinas, who say that the ethics and the way that we live comes first. And religion and a, and a real true religious Jewish faith is something that should support um, an ethical society where our conscience uh, lives and thrives. And the questions that I'd like to end with, there's some of um, um, some questions that, that I've considered, and then I'd be happy to, to hear some of your questions as well. Must we all be Abraham? We're talking about this ideal figure, um, but really, you know, is this not just for the, the, the virtuous or the, the pious? Is this something that we're all, um, that we all should be engaged in or only the people who kind of uh, sense or, or feel divine revelation? In other words, how relevant is this? What does he represent for us? Okay, because I've spoken about this as an ideal. I'm not speaking about a biblical character even. I'm talking about a religious ideal. Okay. Another question. Must we at the end of the day reject rationalism like those who came before modernity in preference for passion or experience? Should we no longer speak about um, you know, religious categories, existence of God, creation and the world. Should we not try to talk about that rationally or logically? 
if we're going to talk about experience. What about the idea of spontaneity? Because Abraham had to act on um, great spontaneity. Um, but also there were kind of delays or time lapses in, 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 in um, the way that he responded to things. And actually, the moment that, that comes very quickly is the moment of the call to, to not murder. In other words, doing the right thing maybe requires that kind of that dilemma, that deliberation, as well as being spontaneous. This poses questions to us about religious violence. Can we be passionate about our religion? Can we have scenarios where we feel passionate to engage um, in, in religious command without that perhaps resorting to, to violence? And is there sometimes a fine line between passion and violence? And a couple of quite uh, of a lot broader questions, but I think questions that really, really come to the fore in light of this reading. How do we place the ethical more at the center of our religion? How do we emphasize what is ethical? And what is the meaning of dialogue in our faith? Okay, because we've looked at these Jewish philosophers who focus on dialogue, but what's it really talking about? How does it play out in our lives? Who is the dialogue with? And how might we envisage this to be? So we've seen some different models of, um, of this ideal, this idealized um, um, figure. We've looked at um, the theological, the Christian interpretation of, um, of the Akedah, of this powerless Abraham, and then shown how these uh, Jewish philosophers um, uh, come to critique and, and attack him um, for, for proposing something that is hugely um, subjective and egotistical, um, and, and which aligns violence, faith, um, and passion together. And we've seen that in their view, in this philosophical view, this is hugely problematic. And once we say this, it brings to the fore huge issues at the heart of, um, of, of religious life and religious community um, in terms of, you know, what do we want to prioritize? When we speak about an individual religious conscience, how can we talk about a communal conscience? Can we talk about, if we talk about a dilemma, for example, can we talk about a communal um, or an educational response to a particular dilemma? And how can we in our own lives perhaps, and in light of this story, tell this story differently? And I think this is a little bit subversive really, um, in some ways to bring this and say, we can tell this story differently. We can look at this story and say, this is not a story about the sacrifice of Isaac. This is a story about the non-sacrifice of Isaac. Because what didn't happen actually comes to um, 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 behold in a sense the, the, the model or the ideal of religion that we've been seeking. The call away from the evil the ability to, to discern, you know, perhaps in, in, in our lives, um, in those moments of, of dilemma, ethical dilemmas that we all have, what is the Jewish approach to responding to an ethical dilemma? So I hope this philosophical reading has, um, has given you much to think about. Um, I know that some of the philosophical language is very jargony and um, I can only, um, apologize and pick very small sections um, but I hope it has been meaningful to you and I'd be delighted to to hear some questions from you and if you don't get a chance to ask a question I'm happy to be in touch uh, via email
Thank you so much. I think you you did a remarkable job of distilling these, you know, reams of um, kind of troubled, complex thought and interpretation of the story into these um, accessible excerpts for us and 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 stringing them together in a in a way that really helps us follow. So so thank you. You've you've made up for so much of the jargon. Um, so I just thought it was worth reading um, two two comments that really um kind of speak to different sides of the dialogue that you were just just discussing <clears throat> um so one person I'll, I'll just read these two verbatim so one person wrote um people who claim to be doing what god tells them to do and claim no personal power can be theocratic autocrats who try sometimes successfully to make others live and believe exactly as they do causing often violent religious persecution an extension of God is on my side. So, and then on completely the other side, um, someone challenges perhaps perhaps Levinas, um, if you put the ethical in the center, aren't you creating a subjective religion where the individual decides what is ethical? So it's like a um, sort of damned if you bring your own ethical sensibilities to it and damned if you don't. Um. Thank you. So I'm going to just talk about the, um, the, the second question um, first, really, because, well, actually, the, the, the first question, I mean, it seems to me like it's a, um, an apt description <laughs> um, of, of, of what this is in, in, in different words. And I'm, I'm happy for those words because they also bring in that broader discourse of um, um, politics and theopolitics into the discussion, which is, of course, so of course, it's not just a religious or a philosophical discussion. Um, we're talking about how we live. We could, you know, talk about it further. We could even kind of expand it to international relations. It can, you know, it can really, um, but but definitely in terms of uh, politics and, and Derrida kind of began to make that connection, not with this story, um, but it, it has some ramifications in uh, philosophy, but the first comment definitely spot on. Um, and I agree. The second, the second question is also, a, 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 you know, the damned if you do, the damned if you don't. There's a name for that <laughs> dilemma. It's called the youth pro dilemma. And it's, um, it's, the, the name is irrelevant. It's really this this idea in in, uh, in 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 theology that is something good because God commands it, or is it good um, because um, because it's hang on, is it good because God commanded it, or is it good because it's being commanded by God? In other words, where does the goodness is the goodness subjective? Or if the good is the goodness objective, and you know, I think many of us are aware of this critique. Well, if you're going to say it's subjective, we know that what is right for some people in some societies is evil in other societies. Even in today's Western world, you know, there are parts of the world today where you know there are horrific things going on. Sometimes they're you know closer than maybe we would we would um, consider them to be. That whole idea of subjective religion is a is a huge issue in modern thought. And you know, whoever asked that question, for everyone really, it's it's one of the biggest, biggest questions that you've asked in terms of religion in a in a modern era, because it's when we begin to talk, say essentially that any rationalist language you use or universalist you think it's universalist language you use to speak of God, you must be aware that you are speaking with a subjective voice. And as soon as you say that, you realize that we are all subjective. And then what? Um, and then we as, as, as human beings have to organize ourselves um, um, around this. But I do think, you know, if something is subjective, it's not necessarily weak it's not necessarily powerlessness it can have a lot of um, 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 confidence humility 
I didn't mean to say confidence, can have a lot of humility and, and beauty in that humility. In other words, what I'm saying is true, but it's not true for everyone in the world. And in some of the research I'm involved in, this is something I'm trying to, um, to look at, really, a, a, a Jewish theory of uh, subjectivity or Jewish thought in the postmodern world. Um, because these are really the issues of our day. And that dilemma and that problem, you know, that has that question that has come up, that's exactly where we're at. Um, maybe we can squeeze in one quick question. I just have to say where I am in northern New Jersey, there's like torrential rain going on that, that we haven't had rain in a few weeks. And it's like really bringing out the drama <laughs> of everything you're, <laughs> you're saying. Um, so I, I keep looking out the window because I'm so distracted by that, um, the soundtrack to this session for me. Um, so just to squeeze in one it more. It adds thing. drama for us. So yeah. Um, so I hope, hopefully you're comfortable um, addressing this, this question, but let's say if you're not. Um, someone was asking how, you know, based on, on everything you've laid out, um, how should we, or perhaps how do you um, understand that we read this story on Yom Kippur in, in our services? What are, wow. What is it asking of us? Wow. Maybe it's food for thought for another, <laughs> another time. Yeah, but I, it, it is, uh, and I'm really grateful for that, but, but um, one of the one of the things I, that that is so important, and you know, we're talking about text. You know, we can talk about this as a method because this isn't a text that occasionally we'll read. This this is part of the liturgy. This has a place in its liturgy, and for many people, that's the only time it is heard and read. And the way it's contextualized in that liturgy is, is, is hugely important. How does that connect to the philosophical reading? I'm now going to go away and think about that. Thank you. And I apologize, it's, it's, on, Yom, it's on Rosh Hashanah that we read it, not Yom Kippur, um, just for the record. But it's the way I think we'll all, um, we'll all be heading into these, these high holidays with, um, you know, with sort of some new thoughts to, um, to ask ourselves as we listen to this story. Um, there were so many wonderful comments and questions that we didn't get to. So I just apologize to everyone for that because we could we could really um, be unpacking this for you know another couple of hours, but, um, but it's a good beginning to uh, um, to the conversation. And um, and I think there, I think your session really adds to the series. Um, We've been looking at stories in different ways, but what you're bringing to us is, um, you know, what what are we going to do with a with a story that has a host of of deeply troubling questions, and um, how is it going to inform how we understand what what religion is asking of us and what it, what it means to be a religious person and a Jewish person? So. Um, it's a lot of uh, a lot at stake with this story, and which is you know which is why these these philosophers have dedicated so much time to it. So again, thank you so much for um, for distilling them and um, and bringing them um, kind of stringing it all together in a way that we could really really consider their points of view. And um, I think much for all of us to continue thinking about. Thank you so much. It's really wonderful privilege to come and uh, join your group this evening. Um, and our, our uh, JTS students, this will be a treat for them um, to study with you. Um, I want to uh, just thank everyone for coming and um, and let people know actually um, Dr. Feldman K is, um, her, her, um, one of her courses this fall is part of our open classroom program, which is um, which allows for auditing. Um, so just watch your um, emails, your JTS newsletter for um, an announcement about Open Classroom. And if you're interested in um, learning more, I think it's on this topic, correct? Um, you have, there's a whole semester long opportunity to do that. <clears throat> um, 
and uh, we hope to see you back next week. We will be studying with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, JTS Professor Emeritus, um, Dr. Ray Shinlin. Um, he'll be looking at um, a medieval text, the Book of Delight um, by Joseph Ibn Zabara, and it should be wonderful. So thanks everyone for coming. Thank you again to Dr. Feldman Kay and look forward to learning with all of you again soon. Thank you.